So I didn't want to go through this too quickly because it's too beautiful to neglect. Okay. So one thing that, that Archimedes discovered was that there is a very interesting relationship between a sphere and the cylinder that in a cylinder that happens to kind of circumscribe the sphere. Does that make sense? So as you'll notice here, we have the sphere of radius R and we have a cylinder around it that's like perfectly snugged up against it, yes? Now, remember Archimedes was the first person to actually prove what the formula for the area of a circle was. And before Archimedes, people didn't even realize that pi, uh, which, which they knew to be the ratio of the circum uh, circle circumference to its diameter, that's just what they called that constant. They were like, we know it's constant, let's call it pi, whatever it is. And uh, Archimedes shocked the world, literally, when he, uh, when he announced that the formula for circular area also involved that constant pi. Yeah, that was a shock. And you ought to sit there and think, huh, uh, that is interesting that that same constant appears and not only in the formula for circumference, which is a like linear one dimensional measurement essentially, right? And that that same formula shows up as a two dimensional measurement of area. Does that make sense? And by the way, it shows up again in a three dimensional measurement of volume of a sphere. Do you know what the formula for volume of a sphere is? Four thirds pi times the radius cubed. Yeah? Four thirds pi times the radius cubed. Right? So uh, the volume of this sphere, oops, let me just kind of write on here straight up, okay? So the volume of this sphere, okay, so the volume of that sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. Now, what about the volume of the cylinder? So that's the volume of the sphere. Let me see, volume of the sphere. So I'll put V sub S for the volume of the sphere. Volume of the cylinder equals what? Okay, so um, now I'm talking about the cylinder itself, right? So what about the cylinder? How would you compute the volume of that? Do you remember? Uh, right, so, so it's gonna be the area, like any time, okay, this is something the Greeks would have known decently well, anytime you have a cylindrical shape or a prism shape of some kind, it's always the area of the base times the height. Yeah? Area of the base times the height. The area of the base in this case is pi r squared. Know what I mean? So it's gonna be pi r squared. That's the area of the base times the height, right? And by the way, Archimedes is the one that found that formula for the area of the base, yes? Because that indeed is a circle times the height. What is the height? 2r. Okay, and so if you kind of simplify that, you get 2 pi r cubed, okay? 2 pi r cubed. All right, so what is the relationship between the volume of a sphere and the volume of the cylinder? Clearly, the volume of the cylinder is bigger. Do you know what I mean? Okay, uh, so like if I take the ratio, of course the Greeks were obsessed with ratios. If I take the ratio of the volume of the sphere or of cylinder over the volume of the sphere, uh, lots of cancellation happens. For instance, like the pi r cubes cancel, know what I mean? And so I end up with like two is the only thing that survives from the top thing and four thirds from the bottom thing. You see it? So maybe I can invert the four thirds and I end up with three over two. Does that make sense? I get three over two. Now, uh, you might say to yourself, so what? Well, what that means is, is we have a very specific relationship between how much the cylinder could hold in relationship to the sphere that it circumscribes, okay? So essentially, if I could fill up that sphere with water, what, how much more water could, you know, could, uh, could go into the cylinder itself? Like what percentage more, 
what's that? Well, 50% more, yes? 50% more is what you, right? Because it's uh, like one and a half times as large. What this is saying is the volume of the cylinder, I mean, think about it, let me just kind of rewrite this. The volume of the cylinder is one and a half is equal to one and a half uh, volumes of the sphere, yes? Yeah? So if I can just rearrange that. So that means that literally the cylinder is 50%, like it holds 50% more volume than the sphere itself, yeah? And Archimedes found that to be fairly interesting. Fairly interesting, okay? And he found it to be fairly interesting for another reason. So one and a half, so essentially you have like a, a three to two ratio between the cylinder and the sphere, yes? You sort of have a three to two ratio. Make sense? Okay. Now, uh, let me a let's ask another question. What about surface area? What about surface area? And by the way, uh, Archimedes was just blowing everybody out of the water. Nobody really knew a, a formula for the volume of the sphere. Nobody really knew the formula for, uh, they, they would have basically known what the formula should be for the volume of a cylinder, but they didn't know what the, how to compute the area of the base of the cylinder because they didn't know the formula for the area of a circle, yeah? Okay, so, uh, so this was all new. I mean, Archimedes was sort of blazing the trail here. Yes, there was a hand up back here. No, no hand? Oh, okay, well, what, what, what question was I asking? For the, you're, you're asking for what? Oh, yes, we are going to ask. So, thank you. What is the formula for the surface area of a sphere? Oh, right. So you're so the okay. So the surface area of the cylinder is what you're you're, you're computing. Okay. So you're saying surface area of the cylinder. Okay, so yeah, let's let's do that computation, right? So he's so we've already determined that the volume of a cylinder is is half again as large as the volume of a surface. That's that's actually how Archimedes would have said it. He would have said the volume of a cylinder is half again as large as the volume of a sphere. Okay, uh, but let's talk about surface area. So what about it? So uh, you know area area of a cylinder. Okay, what, the, what is the area of the cylinder, okay? Um, so what did you just say? Okay, so two pi r squared. Okay, so why, why two pi r squared? Two pi r squared, okay. Okay, because that's, so, uh, so where you're getting this from is from the top bottom, right? Okay, because you have two circles. And then what about the lateral surface area, the lateral surface area that goes all the way around? The lateral surface area, how would you compute that? Think about it, think about it. Yeah. Circumference of the circle times the height, because if you think about it, if I were to slice this, if I slice this bad boy right down the edge and unraveled it, it would be a, a rectangle. Do you know what I'm saying? What's the height of that rectangle? Right, what I'm talking about is like kind of slicing it like this and unraveling kind of the lateral surface area around the side, yes? The height of that would be 2R and and the width of that thing would just be the circumference. You know what I'm saying? Right, so you would, have, you would have the circumference of this thing. So what is the circumference of that? Two pi r, right? And the height, of course, is two r, right, which is given over there. So, so then I would have to take this thing and add, so what would it be? 2 pi r times 2 r, which is 4 pi, 4 pi r squared. Huh. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of like the lateral, lateral surface area. Yeah, the, air, the area around on the cylinder. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, 
So you have, all right, so four pi r squared. What is the area of the sphere? What is the surface area of the sphere? Do you remember the formula for the area of a sphere? And incidentally, Archimedes would have discovered this on his own too. Four pi r squared. Four pi r squared. Now, what do you notice? Look, you have this and this. So what, what he would have instantly noticed is, hey, uh, excuse me, the lateral surface area, that's sort of interesting, right? The lateral surface area of the cylinder is exactly the same as the entire area of the surface, yeah? So what that means is if I were to like shrink wrap, the lateral surface area it would fit perfectly around that sphere. In fact, that's actually used sometimes, okay? So you see that like the lateral surface of the area around that is exactly the same as the area of that sphere. So if I were to shrink wrap that and not lose any surface area in doing so, it would perfectly encompass that, that sphere. Does that make sense? But the cylinder has this additional little two pi r squared on there, which by the way, is what percentage more? 50%. So the surface area is 50% larger for the cylinder than it is for the sphere, which is exactly what happened for volume. You know what I'm saying? So once again, we see that the area of a cylinder is equal to three halves, right? It's 50% bigger than the area of the sphere, right? So look, I have this and I have this, which are both very interesting facts. So this, this would literally, uh, I mean, Archimedes was obsessed with this fact. He was like, wow, that is amazing that both volume and surface area preserve this 50% more relationship, okay? And, uh, and that's why he insisted on having this thing put on his tombstone when he died, okay? Uh, he, wanted, he wanted this engraved on there. He thought this was fantastic. Okay, any questions on that? I think that's, that's kind of, uh, the, the, he considered this to kind of be his crowning achievement, by the way. You know, after, I mean, really, area of a circle started all of this. That was, that was the idea that really got the ball rolling. But then once, once he kind of had his technique down, he called it like the method of exhaustion, where he was approximating with circumscribed and inscribed polygons, which we saw him utilize. Uh, really, this got the ball rolling, and, and then he was just doing things like crazy. But it was really the circle that got everything going in the first place. Okay, any questions on this? I think that's kind of neat. I hope you think it is, too. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Hang on. So look at this, the surface of any sphere is equal to four times the greatest circle in it. So this is something he proved along the way. What is he saying? The surface of any sphere is equal to four times the greatest circle in it. What is he saying there? That, that's the kind of language these guys would use. The surface of a sphere is equal to four times the greatest circle in it. What's the greatest circle in a sphere? The equator. That's pi r squared, yeah? You have radius r. So what he's saying is the area of the sphere is equal to four pi r squared, which is exactly what we were just talking about, yeah? So that would have been one of his propositions. Um, he, and he was just going crazy with his like reductio, double reductio ad absurdum stuff. What he did there, instead of approximating with like uh, instead of approximating with like you know uh, polygons from the inside and outside, he actually did things with like frustrums of cones, and he approximated from the inside and outside, and he actually was able to to prove this formula. Okay. And one thing I wanted to do. So look at this proposition thirty-four. Look at this. This is uh, any sphere is equal to four times the cone which has its base equal to the greatest circle in the sphere and its height equal to the radius of the sphere. What are you saying, Archimedes? Essentially, I promise uh, 
that this is basically, this is simply saying that the area of a sphere is equal to four thirds pi r cubed, okay? Because he would have known, what he's talking about here is he's talking about a cone that has radius r, and what's the height of this cone? What's he saying the height of this cone is? I think he's saying it's r, yeah? And what would the volume of this cone be? What would the volume of this cone? Let me move this thing out of the way so you can see. One third pi r cubed, okay? And what he was doing is he was kind of imagining this cone living inside of a sphere of radius r. Radius r. And then he basically says, here's the cone right here living inside of it, yeah? So this thing is R right here. There's the cone, and what he's saying is, the volume of that cone, which happens to be one-third pi R cubed, which by the way, uh, the Greeks would have had some clue about, but Archimedes would have proved it beyond any shadow of a doubt. He's saying the, the, sir, the area of this, or not the area, what, what do I mean here? Not area, but what? The volume of that thing, okay? the volume of the sphere is equal to four thirds pi r cubed, four times the volume of that cone. Make sense? Four times the volume of that cone. That's what he's saying. And I think, incidentally, people are still figuring out the stuff that Archimedes did. Because a lot of his writings are kind of indiscernible. Like he just talks in like these huge paragraphs and it's like, what are you saying? And it's taking people a long time, one, to sort of translate it over into English, but then second, to discern what it is that's actually being said. And it's, it's been shocking to you know, math, math historians that Archimedes did a lot of stuff that we didn't know he did. Uh, and this was like 2,000 years before calculus was even invented, okay? So there's this amazing video that I wanna show you, okay? And it's a little weird because this, this video will actually be uh, another video, but that's okay. Uh, you know, on, on the beautiful math page, but uh, let's go ahead and and open this up, and we'll we'll watch this video. Let's let's see if let's make sure. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Hang on a second, Gary. Hey, hang on a second, Gary. I want to turn this up. <laughs> he does two proofs of this in his career. Uh, one is a geometric proof, and this one he considered more of an informal proof. And it uses something known as the law of the lever. I'll show you how that works. Now, the first thing to know about the law of the lever is if I have two equal weights, like in this case, these two circles of equal area, they would balance. Hang on a second, guys. I'm trying to get this thing out of the way here. I'm going to stop sharing this for a minute, John, and then I'll come back in. No. First thing to know about the law of the lever is if I have two equal weights, like in this case these two circles of equal area, they would balance the fulcrum, uh, fulcrum is right in the middle, uh, right between the two things. But if the things have different sizes, then the only way to get them to balance would be to move the fulcrum uh, closer to the larger object. So for instance, as I'm making this other figure smaller, in order for these things to balance, uh, the distance from the fulcrum to the smaller weight has to be bigger. As you can see, if you multiply EG, which is the length from the fulcrum to the bigger weight, times the uh, 
uh, the weight of the bigger thing, which is the area of the circle. In order for them to balance, GF multiplied by the weight of the smaller objects has to equal the same constant, in this case, 74.64. And the smaller that other object is, the closer it needs to, the fulcrum needs to be to that, uh, to that other, to the bigger object. Now, I can read a general strategy is that he already knows what the volume of a um, cylinder is, and he also knows what the volume of the cone is. He has the formulas for both of those. He's going to geometrically prove that this um, cylinder would balance out two cones and two spheres. And from that, he's going to be able to figure out what the volume of the sphere has to be. So I'm going to show you how that works. Here's a nice 3D rendering of what is goals. He's going to do this with geometry. So he's going to prove that the, the cylinder would balance out these two cones and these two spheres. I'm going to show you how he establishes this uh, balance later, but for now, let's just say after he's established this, we can say that the volume of the cylinder ends up being 8 pi r cubed. The volume of the cone is 8 thirds pi r cubed. Uh, the cylinder is two cones and two spheres. We'll go over here, substitute in the volume of this of the cylinder, the volume of the uh, cone here. And it becomes an algebra problem. And when you subtract four pi r cubed minus eight thirds pi r cubed, you get the famous formula that the volume of the sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. Uh, but now I'll show you how he establishes using geometry that this cylinder will balance out the two cones and the two spheres. Take a look at this diagram. I have circle with diameter AC. I also have on AC two squares, one drawn uh, with AC at the bottom side and one drawn with AC at the top side. So I have this big rectangle created with two squares. And I also have these two diagonals drawn. In. What I have here is a circle, a big triangle here, by the way, I just want to talk, say this, because I don't know if he's super clear on this. Look at that. There is a, look at that. That looks like a cross section of a, of a cylinder, doesn't it? Like if I took a cross section, did you see that cylinder that was kind of hanging like this? If I took a cross section of that, what would I get? A rectangle, yes? What do you think that, so look at that big, I have, I have that big, the things that he's highlighted right there in pink. What does that look like, the cross section of? Cone, and then what about the circle itself? Sphere, right? And remember the law of the lever says, uh, what has to happen? Well, the sort of distance from the center of mass, from the actual fulcrum to the center of mass, that distance times the weight, of whatever's going on there has to balance with, you know, the thing on the other side, the distance to the center of mass times that thing, okay? So that's, that's gonna be everything and also a big rectangle. Uh, AH is drawn to be the same length as AC. I also have this point M down here. That actually I can move around. M is just uh, the point on the bottom of the rectangle. And when I make the line parallel to the uh, height of the rectangle, Q is where this line intersects the bottom diagonal line. R is where it intersects the circle, and S is where it intersects the diameter. But we're going to use this picture to establish the relationship. There's a lot of lines in this picture. So one quick thing I want to establish is if we just look at the circle itself, uh, we have the relationship that AS times SC is equal to SO squared. That's uh, probably because AOC is a right triangle. Also, the uh, cross chords theorem allows you to just... You guys realize that that's a right triangle? Why is that a right triangle? Yeah, he's saying this is a, well, why is this a right triangle? What does it intercept? It intercepts a di the diameter, right? And remember, like if, if this thing intercepts the diameter, then this angle right here is is half, like if I were to draw a dot right here, it's half this angle right here. Does that make sense? Which means this is a right angle right here. And what he's saying is you have this relationship that AS times SC 
is equal to the square of this. And that's just, that's just a, that has to do with similar triangles, okay? There's nothing deep going on here. It's just, it just has to do with the fact that this triangle right here and this triangle right here are similar, and therefore it preserves ratios of sides, yes? Okay, it's similar because this right here happens to be a right triangle. I don't know what this theorem he's quoting is, but it's complicated. He's, he's making it too complicated. It's not really that complicated, okay? So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, moving on. some relationships between the sides. For instance, you could say that SO squared plus AS squared, uh, because SO squared is AS times SC, you could replace it with that. Then you can factor out the AS to get SC plus AS. But SC plus AS equals AC. So now we have this relationship. Uh, so if we take this is equal to that, we can say SO squared plus AS squared equals AS times AC. If we multiply both sides of this equation uh, by AC times pi, both sides, we get this. AC bracket pi SO squared plus pi AS squared equals AS uh, times pi AC squared. Now we can do a couple of substitutions. AC over here is equal to AH, so I'm going to change that to AH. Pi SO squared. Now, AS is actually uh, equal to SQ because uh, this is uh, an isosceles right triangle. So I can say plus pi SQ squared equals AS times pi. And AC is part of the square. And MS, no matter where M is, MS is also. Uh, equal to the size of that square, so I'm going to call it uh, SM squared. So now we've got this relationship. Now this doesn't seem like a very important relationship, but now he's going to utilize the law of the lever. <coughs> now the law of the lever says that if I have something like this, it means that 3 times 6 equals 2 times 9. But it also works the other way around. Let's say I had an, an, an equation like uh, 4 times 8 equals 2 times 16. That would mean that I could take a, a fulcrum and split it up so that one is 4 and one length is 2. And then if I put a 16 pound weight here and I put an 8 pound weight here, that they would balance. Well, this thing has that form. We have something times something else equals something times something else. So he's going to establish that if I had circles, if I had a circle that had radius SM, and I put it at a distance of AS from the center of a fulcrum, it would balance out two circles, one with radius SO and one with radius SQ, if they were at a distance of AH from the center. Geometrically, what this means is if I have my picture here and I move it into the third dimension, if A is the center of my balance, my fulcrum, as this point moves around, this circle here will balance out these two circles. These two circles are a distance AH from A, whereas this circle is AS from A. So take a look as I move that around. Every time I move it, this one circle at this position will balance out these two circles. With one thing he doesn't make very clear is where does this circle come from? I just want to point this out because this is awesome. Okay. 
where do these circles come from? Well, like there's this circle right here, S, the one that has SO right here. It's this circle. Can you see me drawing this? This circle is the same as that one. Yes. Okay. And where's he getting the other circle? Well, it's this one right here. Like it's, it's going, it's, it's this one right here, right? It's the one with S, uh, Q, I guess is what this is, right? So that's where that one's coming from. That those two circles, he, on the previous page, he said, he said the law of the lever says that those two circles will balance this big circle right here. Yeah. If we have things situated in this way. Okay. So one of them, the small circle makes up the sphere. Do you see what I'm saying? What about the larger of those two? What is that making up? The cone, yeah? So that's what's going on here. And I think, I, I, But all of those circles with, uh, with radius SM together make up a cylinder. And those smaller circles, when they get put together, reconstruct a sphere and a cone. So when you put together all those circles, all these uh, vertical circles here, with SM as their radius, you get a big cylinder. The circle balances out on the other side, two circles, one that's part of the sphere, one that's part of the cylinder. Now, the center of gravity of the entire cylinder is just the center of the cylinder itself, which is a distance of r radius from a. The center of gravity of the sphere and the cylinder, each of the circles individually has a center of gravity of a, so so does the entire thing. But this tells us the cylinder times the radius is the sphere plus the cone times two times the radius. That's, that's a here. And uh, that means that if I move the cylinder over, so that it's two times the radius, well, it would balance out two spheres and two cones, which is what we have right here. The end. <laughs> there it is. The end. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. I mean, to me, it's like, how on earth did he draw inspiration from the law of the lever to sort of prove that these volume things would, would balance out. I would encourage you to go watch that video carefully and just, just kind of try to grasp everything that's happening. It's really not that complicated. But the key is that you have to see how the law of the lever actually shows that all of this stuff is, is balancing out truly. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing for sure. Okay. Any questions on that? I think that's pretty slick. It's worth worth spending some time looking at. By the way, uh, that guy particularly has several uh, several ways that Archimedes actually proved lots of his formulas. Uh, how did he How did he come up with the formula for the surface area of a sphere, for instance? Well, there he had to get really pretty creative. He actually pulled it off somehow. And incidentally, uh, Archimedes had like another argument that I want to show you really quick for the area of a circle. It went it went like this. This is uh, interesting. One thing that Archimedes did, maybe I'll kind of try to go to the next slide and there might be room. Actually, I'll do it right here. He took and he drew a circle, okay? And then he like carved it up. He thought of carving this thing up into a bunch of pizza pie slices. You know what I'm saying? Okay, by the way, this thing has radius R and, uh, and you know, circumference C equal to two pi R, okay? Etc. And then what he did is he kind of rearranged. He rearranged all those pizza pie slices like this. He kind of took one and he put it like this. Then he took the next one and he put it down here. And he took the next one and he put it here. And he took the next one and he put it here. And he took the next one and he put it here, etc. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, if I, if I cut it into a lot of slices, what is this gonna start to look like? A rectangle, this looks like a rectangle. And in the limit, excuse me, 
He's doing calculus 2,000 years before Isaac Newton. Do you know what I mean? What is the length of one? What's the length? What's the height of this rectangle? Just the radius. And what is the length of the so, of one of the sides of that rectangle? Careful. It's one half. One half what? The circumference. It's half of the circumference. So the area of this thing is equal to one half radius times the circumference, which since the circumference is two pi r, gives us what? Pi r squared, yeah? So that was another argument that, that, that he basically gave as kind of like a, an intuitive argument. He didn't consider this to be rigorous. Does that make sense? He didn't know how to make this rigorous, but he knew basically what the formula for the area of the circle had to be before he uh, gave his rigorous proof involving the triangle that we looked at last time. Does that make sense? That's why I say that Archimedes was really way ahead of his time in terms of doing limiting processes and whatnot. All right. All right. Questions on that? Okay, we're gonna leave uh, Archimedes behind. On Wednesday, we'll we'll finish up uh, some stuff with some logic. We'll look at a couple of proof techniques and we'll be off and running. And I think Friday, someone else is gonna present some history stuff.